subtitle is described as computational limnologist, which sounds super fancy, but essentially means that I used to spend time looking at lakes like this in my waders, but I actually spend a little bit less time looking like this these days and more time looking at lakes like this. So I do a lot of um, modeling of lake systems, lakes and reservoirs um, to understand their different functioning. Recently, I've been involved in some forecasting work, primarily working on water temperature forecasting in lakes and reservoirs. We have two ongoing projects up here at Virginia Tech, one working with some reservoirs at, um, monitored by the Western Virginia Water Authority, and another using the lake sites that form part of the National Ecological Observatory Network, which I'll talk a little bit more in a second. So that's me. Um, why would we be interested in forecasting water quality and freshwater systems generally? Freshwater systems are super important, and that's not just me being biased as a limnologist. Uh, like humans rely on freshwaters for many different uh, ecosystem services, and these freshwater systems are increasingly threatened by um, overexploitation and other. Uh, environmental degradation, including large-scale climate change. And freshwater systems are even more threatened than terrestrial and marine systems. So you can see this figure on the right, the um, biodiversity of freshwater systems has drastically decreased in the last uh, 10 years. In order to manage these increasingly threatened systems, water quality forecasts provide um, information to allow managers to preemptively um, make management decisions in an informed way um, so that we can continue to maintain the important ecosystem services. Alongside um, this kind of management angle, water quality forecasts can also provide um, information to help us understand more about how these systems are functioning and learn more about the um, kind of the science around um, around the, the, the ecosystems. They, Doing freshwater forecasting provides like a, a robust out of sample forecast for us to test our um, water quality models. I just wanted to show you some examples of some different water quality forecasts that are being produced at the moment. So this one is from the National Centers of Coastal Ocean Science. Uh, they produce harmful algal bloom forecasts. This is um, a forecast for Lake Erie for tomorrow, I think, tomorrow evening, yep. Um, so this is like a spatial forecast where they're looking at where the cyanobacterial densities might occur um, on parts of Lake Erie. Another is more of like an event-based forecast. So this is from one of our Virginian reservoirs. Um, this figure on the right shows the percent chance that a mixing event will occur. These mixing events in lakes and reservoirs are really important for their water quality. They determine where the nutrients are going to occur um, so understanding when this event is going to happen is really important for, for managers. Um, and then another is from a river system where they're forecasting water temperatures. Um, and then this dash line around 22 degrees Celsius is kind of a threshold level for some of the species in this river. And so understanding when these um, warmer temperatures are likely to occur and when some water quality de degradation event might happen um, is it also important for managers. At the moment, water quality forecasting is dominated by this, these dissolved oxygen and temperature forecasts. Um, and these are primarily deterministic, meaning they don't have some quantification of uncertainty. And that is still something we're developing in, in our water quality forecasts. Currently, we're using a very, various different methods to produce these forecasts, including complex process models, um, and then also data-driven methods and machine learning. To produce these forecasts, a range of uh, different data sources are used. So one is some high frequency uh, sensor network. So where the, the, the water body is um, installed with uh, high frequency sensors that collect information in, in, in a high frequency way. Other forecasts such as that um, harmful algal bloom forecast from Lake Erie use a large scale remote sensing imagery, um, but the the data type that we use really depends on the system that you're trying to forecast and the variable of interest. 
um, which may or may not have infrastructure in place um, at, at each particular site. One network that we've been leveraging um, here and as part of um, EFI is the National Ecological Observatory Network. This is a network of sites across the United States, which has 81 terrestrial and importantly for us, 47 aquatic sites. Uh, the data was started collected around 2016 and they aim to collect long-term ecological data to kind of understand um, the changes in, in the continental scale ecosystems. Um, they also have like a primary aim to use this data to um, inform uh, ecological forecasts. That's kind of just a very high level intro for, uh, for this on water quality forecasting. Those of you that are going to be working on this case study will go into a bit more detail in the smaller groups about how the data are collected and what data you're going to be using. But for everyone, this is just kind of a brief intro. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about this. I'm going to try my best to answer them. Um, so yeah, hopefully that was sufficient. <laughs> Thanks, Doran. That was really, really great. Uh, one is led by myself and the other one is led by Mike. So um, I think at, at base we're using the same model. So we'll do a quick overview of that now. Um, but some of the details of how we've implemented uh, software to simulate the model are a little different, so that will uh, differ. Okay, so uh, as we all know, COVID uh, had a little bit of an impact in everyone's lives. Um, and I mean, it was a pretty terrible time, I think, overall. But one of the silver linings, I think, is that it really brought uh, to the forefront you know, how useful short-term forecasting can be, especially and modeling and in infectious diseases. I mean, people are used to the example for forecasting of like weather, but I don't think that people really knew that it can be just as powerful in uh, systems that involve, you know, humans and human behavior uh, as much. So the model that we'll be using, uh, and I imagine, I feel like since the pandemic, the you know public consciousness of these kinds of models has increased. So you may have already seen this kind of model before, and I, I referenced SIR models earlier in the day, um, but the model we're using is slightly more advanced in that it has not just susceptible, infectious, and recovered states. So every um, part, every member of the population is in one of these states at all times, right? Um, as a compartmental model. And we've added the exposed state, which basically creates a slightly more realistic distribution of time between infections, um, which is helpful for modeling. But basically, your susceptible exposed people are infected, but they're not yet infectious, so they can't spread, but they are part of the infectious, um, infected, sorry, state, which is kind of the combination of these two, then there's infectious people who can spread and then recovered or removed um, in some way. Um, you could interpret that to be potentially uh, not just recovered and alive, but possibly dead as well, or you could explicitly model that in another compartment if you wanted to. And the rates at which these um, transitions, these flows happen, uh, are put up symbolically here. I think I may have yeah, okay, let's go back to the other one. So the process here from susceptible to exposed represents infection, right? These guys are infected. Um, so that happens with this rate, which I'll point out, this is a really important rate um, because it's state dependent. So yes, all of these actually have, um, you know, a state involved in the rate, but it's always, there's a pattern, right? So these rates have the, uh, rate of the from compartment involved in them. Um, so that's kind of a standard way of doing things. But this rate has another compartment involved. It's not just S, it actually has I. And the way to think about that rate is um, the rate at which people move from susceptible to exposed is going to be proportional to the fraction of infecteds that are out there, I over N. So this is taking into account the random mixing um, assumption, which means that if I bump into someone, what's the probability that they're going to be infected? An easy way to, to um, model that would be I over N, where N is the total population. And then beta is some parameter, which we'll call the transition rate, and that's going to be a huge focus in the case studies. The rest of the process is this is just um, moving from exposed to infectious, so modeling the latent period between when you're infected to when you're infectious. 
And then this is the recovery process um, where gamma models the rate at which people recover. For these two rates, the way to get a handle on them is one over that rate is the time to that event. So one over alpha is the time to becoming infectious and one over gamma is the time to recovery on average. Sort of, yeah, so what are the, sorry, one of the things, uh, key aspects of this and any compartmental model is that you're essentially assuming that you have an infinite or very large population size. And so um, some of the other sort of flavor of models you may see uh, involve things like branching processes or sort of individual based or stochastic models. They tend to be a lot harder to um, put into a um, Bayesian scheme to actually um, and especially sort of for this this uh, course, uh, this this case study, we were sort of thinking about sort of something where we could sort of feasibly do something in a week. Um, but just to say that you know you, you would see other, other these kind of models, and so it's it's interesting to it's important to think about that what you're saying in terms of the sort of observations, all of that is going into your data model in terms of um, the stochasticity. So none of the sort of stochastic kind of process of people interacting with each other, that's not being incorporated into the process model. Okay, and then we can take these, uh, this scheme that we had before this diagram and we can translate it into ODEs, which is what's done here. And that's the, that makes up the process, the deterministic process that's underlying the, um, the, the work that we'll do in the case study. Okay, so as I mentioned, there, we have two approaches. So one is uh, led by Mike. It'll be using data um, from British Columbia and uh, the groups three and four will be working on this and the files you can find in this directory. Whereas for my groups, which are five and six, we'll be looking at data for Ontario and this is our folder here. Um, so the timeline that, that we suggest for our case study, it may be similar to others, but the idea will be that um, you, there is an initial data set in our repositories that is for fitting. So we want you to work on fitting the base model, just the model as we've given you the code for it, um, and do a status quo forecast, make sure everything is working, it looks sensible, inspect your fits, look at the convergence of your chains, etc. all the stuff you're learning now. And then if you have time, try to maybe extend the model. We have some suggestions in the case study document to make the fit better, because it may be that the naive fit, which is what I suspect will happen, will not really work very well. And you'll have to think about how could I improve the model a little bit. Um, and then there is also a decision maker's request that we've given you now, which, has, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and you could start thinking about that if you get if you make really good progress on your fits, but really what we want you to focus on is getting a good first fit and then we can talk about everything else. On Wednesday, we will release some validation data, so this is some additional observations past the original time period so that you can check your initial fit against new data and see how close you were in your prediction and maybe adjust course if it's kind of off. And then, so you'll tweak your fits and produce new forecasts based on those new fits and then start working on your presentation. And then on Friday, we'll focus on presenting those results. So that's what we would suggest. Of course, every group will be a little different. If you're not exactly on this timeline, it's not the end of the world. Just try to kind of keep plugging away at it. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be floating around. We're more than happy to, to help and answer questions. So just a quick preview at the data. Uh, so we have the data you currently have access to is in this reddish purpley period, I guess. So that's the BC data, that's the Ontario data. The validation, so you can see we're modeling, um, I didn't put the year here, sorry. This is the beginning of the pandemic, so this is 2020. Um, we'll be doing, um, you know, from February or so until around the beginning of April. It's slightly different for each data set. And then the validation data you'll get will be about two weeks long in the beginning of April. And then there, the test period, which we won't show you, and we were deciding what we're gonna do. We might uh, maybe ask you to submit your predictions for that period and we'll score them based on the data. And you can see how close you got. The idea is just to simulate the conditions under which we really work, which is sometimes you, don't see, you never see the data or you, know, uh, you see it much later on. So that's one idea for that. 
Okay, and so what's the decision makers request so one one challenge is getting a good fit and producing just a status quo forecast. But in reality, what you're probably going to be doing once you have a model and a fit in hand is trying to answer a policy question for a decision maker. And these requests are often very vague and require a lot of interpretation and assumptions and stuff so we're giving we've given you a vague request on purpose, <laughs> because this is kind of the stuff that we get. So the question is. Imagine you're back in 2020, you're in March, you have some understanding of what's happening with the pandemic. The question is, should we impose mask mandates, for instance? So what impact could a mandatory mask policy in indoor settings have on projected case reports? You can interpret that how you wish, you can, you can model that how you wish, but the idea is that at the end of the day, we want you to try to answer this question in some way. But we have one rule. <laughs> So obviously everyone here lived through the pandemic and knows that a you know kind of what it went like, especially if you were in Ontario or BC. And B that you know the data is online, <laughs> so I know we said we have a test set of data that we're not going to show you, but yeah you could look it up. So what we ask just for this week is that you pretend you're back in March 2020 and all you have access to is the stuff that's been published up to that point. We'll be a little looser on that because there are some resources like one we point you to the Kai Hai had an intervention scan that cataloged all the different interventions across the country like masking whatever that could be useful to you it didn't exist in March 2020 but. What we'll say is just don't look at the entries past the end date of your current data, so the first data set ends around the beginning of April don't look at the stuff for April once you get the validation data, you can look for the next two weeks, please. Do that just because it it'll enhance your experience of this workshop if you don't look at what's already out there. Um, if you want case data or you know including hospitalizations and deaths because there's some extensions that involve looking at hospitalizations or deaths. Um, ask one of us for it, um, because we don't want you accidentally spoiling the case study for yourself by looking for the data. Um, and then for other external sources just don't look past the the time period that you have for the data. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, okay, so, so the question has to do with how the model was cast. And I believe the formulation we're both using assumes that the state variables are numbers of individuals and not proportions. Um, and so therefore one of the parameters you have to divide by n. Um, not, there's not really a reason. I find mathematicians like the proportions casting because it's, it's cleaner, but in terms of implementation and stuff, it's just simpler, I think, to keep it in numbers of individuals. Because then when you look at the results, you don't have to scale up by the population. Um, the, I mean, if you wanted to change it, you're welcome to change the code, but I don't think it'll make a difference. It's it's an infinite population size, right? So you, you can just sort of rescaling. The rescaling shouldn't matter, but the, the mass action term would be it would be a density uh, dependent process, which is what we sort of and at the time and then certainly like afterwards would would assume a process like a respiratory infection would go. Uh, as opposed to sort of something that would be frequency dependent as well, but yeah, I mean, you know, part of this is is to sort of like play around with the model, see 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 what will affect and what won't, and so yeah, that that's something to explore. Anything else? Okay. So let's start off with five fun facts about Pacific salmon in general. Um, so there are five species of Pacific salmon in North America, Chinook, Sockeye, Coho, Pink, and Chum. Um, and for those of you that didn't know, another fun fact is there's actually two more in Asia that we don't have here. Um, salmon are a keystone species. So for the non-ecologists in, in the room, that means they have a disproportionate effect on the ecosystems around them compared to the actual space they make up in biomass in the ecosystem. So they provide a really important transfer of nutrients from marine environments to uh, freshwater environments when they make their migrations upstream that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, they are heroic migrators. I have to scroll down to my notes because I forget this number. Uh, they, 
on average migrate over 10,000 kilometers downstream around the ocean and back up the river to their natal stream. Um, the longest upstream migration is made by Yukon Chinook at 3,000 kilometers. So they travel 3,000 kilometers up rivers against currents in their final dying days, which is pretty heroic. Um, they have an amazing ability to bounce back. I mean, you probably have heard that a lot of Pacific salmon stocks are not in awesome shape, but we also have had cases where um, salmon stocks that have been extirpated for hundreds of years um, coming back when uh, passage is restored. So you can think that a stock is gone forever and you move a dam or you clear an entrance to a river and they're there again. So they're pretty impressive in that sense. And another um, interesting fact is there's actually more Pacific salmon in the North Pacific Ocean right now uh, than ever before in recorded history. So obviously there's lots of winners and losers, and unfortunately a lot of Fraser stocks are losers uh, in this case, but uh, there's tons of salmon out there. Uh, so we're specifically gonna talk about sockeye salmon. Um, so their uh, range spans from Oregon up through Alaska and then all the way around to Japan and Russia. Uh, most of them, uh, there's a lot of variation in life history, but in general, most of them return to their uh, freshwater uh, natal streams in the summer. And they, most of them rear in lakes. This means that after they hatch, they like to spend a winter in a lake before they go out to the ocean. Um, they turn this vibrant red color. So this is a pretty iconic image of a Pacific salmon. And if you didn't know that specifically a sockeye. Um, and they are on the smaller side for Pacific salmon. They're generally less than uh, 15 pounds. So they are, you know, not the, you know, big, impressive king or Chinook salmon, but they're, you know, beautiful little guys. Uh, and in case you were wondering what kokanee are, kokanee are actually landlocked sockeye. So that they are the exact same species, just for whatever reason, they decided they didn't want to go to the ocean anymore. So they just live in lakes and rivers and they're smaller and they just like to chill in fresh water. Um, so I hope most of you have seen a salmon life cycle before, but in case you haven't, uh, this is specific to Fraser sockeye, but uh, all salmon have a similar life cycle. So um, they, uh, their eggs are laid uh, usually in streams, but sometimes in uh, riverbeds and sometimes in lakes. Um, and then they emerge and they go through what we call smoltification. And that means that they're making their downstream migration. They're getting ready, ready for the ocean. And then they go out into the ocean uh, for Fraser sockeye. They like to go up and around, spend some time in the North Pacific. And then they come back down usually as uh, four-year-olds, uh, depending on the stock, sometimes five-year-olds. And then they spawn and then they die. So. It, they have a really interesting um, life history and we've learned a lot uh, over the years about how this life history um, really has caused a lot of like really specific um, traits to different stocks because they keep returning to the same spot over and over again, depending on how deep that stream is or what that habitat looks like that they spawn in, their bodies can be completely different shapes. So you'll see that a, a sockeye that spawns in a deep stream could be the size of a, a dinner plate in the shape of a dinner plate, where um, a stock of sockeye that spawns in a really shallow stream are gonna be long and skinny. So they have this really cool um, across stock variation in traits um, that makes them um, quite robust to changes in the environment because we have a lot of genetic variability across the landscape due to these very specific uh, traits they have. So why do we care? Um, so uh, salmon in general are an essential part of indigenous culture on the west coast um, and dwindling uh, salmon stocks threaten food security uh, for indigenous uh, communities who depend on them yearly for the return of salmon to provide that food source that they you can see here they dry and they save throughout the winter um, Today, upholding Indigenous rights also means providing important economic opportunities for Indigenous communities. So it's not just about feeding themselves in terms of the fish, it's also about um, having access to that economy of catching fish and selling fish. 
And because of this, um, you know, DFO is kind of at the forefront of rec reconciliation with a lot of these Indigenous communities because this is one of the main ways that the federal government interacts with Indigenous communities and, and how our decisions affect their everyday life. Um, they're also an essential part of ecosystems during all of their life stages. So I already mentioned that um, big transfer of marine nutrients into freshwater systems is really important for um, riparian environments. Um, but I'm sure we've also hopefully all heard about southern resident killer whales, which are not doing very well. And we've attributed a lot of their declines to a lack of food availability. And then, of course, as you can imagine, they support a lucrative commercial fishery. So even though stocks are uh, dwindling, we still have fisheries on them. Uh, and these fisheries take place all the way from Alaska down to Oregon. Um, so we need forecasts so that we can make decisions about how to balance these important things. So because of that life cycle, we primarily target them as they're returning uh, to fresh water. So as we have this run of salmon that's coming through, you know, how do we balance these three things, right? Because the number of fish that we catch out in the open ocean is going to affect how much fish are available for ecosystems, how many fish are available for um, indigenous subsistence harvest, which usually happens further up the watershed. Okay, so how do we model them? So kind of our bread and butter when it comes to um, modeling salmon uh, is, usually, is using stock recruitment models. So because of their um, unique life cycle, we actually directly observe this. So in a lot of uh, marine fishes, we make assumptions about uh, stock recruit relationships. So pretty much this means the amount of reproducing fish and then the amount of fish that they produce. So this is usually just an assumed part of a model for a marine fish because we're just taking snapshots of the population through time. But because uh, we get to watch this mass return of fish, we actually see this uh, as uh, spawners and return. So it, we have this unique opportunity also to count them when they're on the spawning grounds because they're in these rivers, lakes, and streams, and they have to pass through passageways and rivers. So we have all kinds of creative ways that we count them that I'll talk about in a minute. But it's cool because we can actually directly, um, we can observe the number of spawners, and then when they're coming back, we can observe the number of returns. And because they die afterwards, we don't have to worry about return spawning and that kind of stuff. We just, we just get to see it as it happens. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the data. So on the X axis there, I had number of spawners. So this is the number of fish that make it back to their natal uh, site to reproduce. Um, and we have so many ways that we count this. Uh, we have a lot of fun counting these. So uh, there might be visual surveys like stream walks. That's just walking up and down a stream you can see in the uh, bottom left there. Uh, walk up and down a stream. Luckily, when you're counting sockeye, they're bright red. You see them and you actually count them. I mean, I don't do a lot of this, but somebody does. Um, or we have other fun things like snorkeling. Snorkel downstreams and count fish. Uh, we'll count from drones uh, and in some really remote, hard to access uh, spots, uh, count from helicopters as well. Uh, we also have passive recording methods like sonars, or we'll set up a fishway so you can kind of see in the top center, you force all the fish to go through one little passageway and then you actually count them by just recording them on camera. Um, and the technique you choose is going to depend on the target species, the system, kind of how important it is, how much money you want to put into it. We're not going to put in a ton of money to count a stock that's only a few hundred fish. So on the really big systems is where you're going to see um, like the expensive sonars or things like that going on. Um, and then it also is going to depend on conditions. So you can see the bottom center, that's a sonar fence. So that's where the sonars would be set up counting fish as they go by. Um, those get blown out in high water events. So there's some places you can't use those. So it's uh, a ton of variability, a ton of fun. Um, and then this is usually paired with some sort of biological sampling. So we'll usually get, uh, take clips of their fins for uh, DNA to help with stock identification because sometimes we're counting them further down river so we don't know specifically which stock they're from. Um, and then we also have these really cool things called otoliths with our, which are bones from a fish's head that have rings that you can count like tree rings to find out how old they are. And we also tag fish to try to get at survival. 
Okay, so then on the y-axis we had returns. So returns are going to be made up of two different things. Returns are made up of catch and what we call escapement. So escapement means they escaped the fishery. Um, so catch, we know where that data is going to come from. It's going to come from commercial catches. We have observers on boats. Uh, we have self-reporting. We have all kinds of mechanisms for that. Uh, and then those escaped fish can kind of suffer two fates. They can die on the way very sadly, or they can spawn and then die and reach their life's goal. Okay, so, okay, no, I, I talked too far ahead, sorry. Uh, so I already talked too much about returns, but again, these, I mentioned catch. So our catch is gonna come from three different sectors. It's gonna, it can come from commercial, it can come from sport, it can come from uh, indigenous fisheries. Uh, getting data from sport fisheries is really interesting. We actually have to go out and uh, we talk to fishers to get an idea of how many they've caught. Then we fly over with helicopters, see how many fishers there are. We do some multiplication, that's how we get at that. Um, and then, yeah, there's some images on the right. This is a, a, a fisheries observer taking samples. So we also do biological samples uh, from uh, commercial catches. And then I, I again, I talked too far ahead, but um, we, I talked about uh, getting return data and we do that, we do a big chunk of that in the Fraser using sonars. So this map on the left just shows one of our main sonar sites and where we have them. And so that's where we're, uh, we're counting like a big, uh, a mix of lots of different stocks as they go by. And then we have to do DNA identification or other things to identify stocks. So that's how we get at, um, we get at escapement. And those are otoliths on the right. So that's how we figure out how old they are because we have to figure out which uh, brood they came from, which I'll talk about more in a sec. Okay, so this is what our data looks like um, for salmon. And it's all by brood year, which means the year that the eggs were put in the gravel. So the year that their parents spawned. And then we actually, um, observe their returns. Oh, sorry, I'm going to talk about this one more sec. So we'll have in that year, the number of spawners, and then the number of recruits that that produced. So the number of adult returning fish that came back four and five years later. And from that, we get a total number of recruits. So you can see how we get a sense of kind of productivity of the stock. So if we had 10,000 fish spawn in 1948, how many adult returning fish that we could catch did that produce? So it's interesting because each row of this actually includes data that's collected in three different years. So we observed the number of spawners in 1948. We saw how many H4s came back from a combination of counting them, looking at the otoliths, divvying them out by age. We observed them in 1952 and we observed them in 1953 and so on. So it actually takes several years to complete each uh, row of data to get an idea of uh, how many fish were produced by that, uh, that brood, we call it. Okay, so you might be thinking this seems boring and really straightforward. You know the number of spawners. How hard is it to get the number of recruits that are going to come from that? You'd think it would be pretty consistent. This is simulated data, unfortunately. This isn't real. It's not. It's not this easy. Um, so we, I mean, to be frank, especially in the last 15 years, we suck at forecasting. We're only forecasting one year ahead and things got really hard lately. The ocean conditions are changing. We're just, we've been really bad at it the last 15 years. So some things we try to do is, you know, splitting out life stages. So one problem with only uh, modeling spawners and recruits is you're kind of modeling two processes. You're modeling how many eggs were laid, how many hatched, how many survived down to the ocean, how many survived in the ocean to return. It's a lot of stages happen in between here that we're glossing over, right? We're just looking at them when they spawn, we're looking at them when they return. So you might uh, try to add in some information if you can maybe catch some juveniles downstream. So that's uh, that picture with the juveniles in the bucket for some stocks where we have a lot of resources available. We'll count juveniles as they come down then we get a little more information. Uh, we might try to incorporate some environmental information Information, like about climate because we know that um, warming oceans are not great for these stocks. They're the food quality that's available for them 
for them in the ocean declines um, when the ocean is warmer. Um, and then another thing that we do that's kind of interesting is we have these models called uh, sibling models. So I don't know if you thought of this when you saw this, but in 1949, when you are looking for, sorry, in 1953, let's say, when you're wondering, okay, how many, um, how many age fours, in, or sorry, how many, I'm getting my numbers mixed up. Pretty much the gist of it is you are going to observe in a given year, you will already have observed age four broodmates the year before. So you can infer something about the age fives that are returning the next year. So let's say it's uh, 2005 and you're expecting a good chunk of age fives to be coming back just the way that the demographics worked out. You can say, okay, well, last year, how many age fours from the 2000 brood year did we observe? Okay, that's, we can, that can tell us something about survival and productivity. So you have that benefit on your side that you've got this dual age cohort coming back. Um, something else we've seen kind of like really across the board in salmon is this kind of um, decline in productivity that's happened in recent years. So you can see on this uh, bottom plot here, I've just got productivity of one of our stocks over time and just fit like a simple breakpoint analysis. And we see this really distinct decline in productivity in, um, in recent years. So um, we're kind of living in a new, not normal, it will never be normal, um, but trying to account for kind of recent things that have happened, looking back saying, how much of this time series of data is actually usable? Because do we really expect things to turn out like they did in 1960? It's like, not really. Um, and then also that base model that we're using. So we were using um, a Ricker stock recruitment curve uh, was one I showed there that has uh, density dependence. That means as the number of spawners gets really high, your number of recruits actually declines due to too high of densities on the spawning grounds. But we can use any number of spawner recruit relationship. So some other ones here are a Beverton Holt model. We, often, we also use one that's just called a power model. So you can play with that base model, play with your add-ons. You've got a couple different um, avenues you can go. So um, that's pretty much all I have. I, I will mention that I am setting up the case study um, like Irina mentioned. So my groups will first start off with trying to predict 2022 returns. And then I'm going to give you the 2022 data. And then you're going to try to estimate the 2023 returns. And you can all look online because that's unfolding right now and see, uh, see if you're right. So yeah. <laughs>